Okay, um, I'm going to be talking, for better or for worse, something uh, uh, much more uh, conservative, maybe less interesting, but uh, uh, I'm going to be talking about some work that I've been doing over the last few years with uh, a bunch of collaborators listed here. Um, first of all, I'm going to uh, talk about what I call induced electroweak symmetry breaking, and I'll, of course, explain what that is. And, um, and uh, as an, example, an interesting example, I think, of non-decoupling physics, um, then I'll talk about it as an example of improving naturalness in the context of supersymmetric theories, and I'll talk about the, the phenomenology at the end. So just to set the, the stage, let's just remember where we are. This is something I think we all know, but it's worth remembering the long journey we've been on. Uh, it was actually since the 1930s when Fermi wrote down his theory of weak interactions that we knew that there was an interesting scale of a TeV. And Fermi literally, if you look historically, he really literally understood this. Of course, we made huge progress, uh, especially in the 80s with the discovery of the W and Z bosons. But still, if we, if we take the theory, including only the degrees of freedom that we know, we still had the same cutoff, this time for WW scattering. And it was only in 2012 with the discovery of the Higgs boson that if we take the theory containing the particles we observed, now suddenly we have a theory that has a cutoff near the Planck scale. So this has obviously caused a lot of angst. We've been living with uh, a fixed target for new physics for a long time, and now we don't have one anymore. Right? Okay. But um, uh, in this situation, people have naturally wondered about whether perhaps the standard model is all there is, or perhaps whether we'll, uh, we can only see small deviations from it. And in fact, this is sometimes enshrined in what's called the Higgs decoupling theorem. Okay? And this is not my formulation of it. This is stolen from somebody's slides who you probably know, but I'm not going to tell you who it is. Um, uh, the, the, the Higgs decoupling theorem says that suppose the Higgs sector contains additional Higgs bosons, but one of them is the light 125 GeV particle that's been observed, then necessarily the rest of the Higgs sector just gives you some uh, additional corrections to the standard model, which are higher dimension, uh, dimension six operators suppressed by mH squared over m squared. Okay? And the proof is, well, just go to the Higgs basis, where the VEV is all in, the, in the, uh, one of the Higgs eigenstates. Integrate the other guys out. You get dimension six operators. That's the proof. Okay? So this theorem, as it's usually stated and understood, is just not correct because it can be spoiled by non-decoupling effects. In other words, the theorem is true only in as far as it is true. Okay? As, it, as you assume that there's no decoupling. So let me just remind you a little bit about non-decoupling physics. The canonical example is the top quark, right? If the top quark mass gets heavy, it leads to effects that are not suppressed by the uh, inverse top mass. And we understand that because the top mass uh, gets its mass from electroweak symmetry breaking, right? And so, for example, this top loop has a power of m top downstairs from dimensional analysis, a power of y top, so the coefficient ends up being independent of m top. Okay? And exactly the same thing can happen with the additional Higgs bosons. Additional Higgs bosons can also get their uh, mass from uh, electroweak symmetry breaking. And just as with the top quark, that will require some of the couplings in the Higgs sector to be somewhat large. But again, like the top, top coupling, not non-perturbatively large, not 4 pi or not 10 to the 10, just order 1, order 1 large. Okay? So rather than try to give a general analysis of this for the Higgs sector, I want to talk about one particular example, which I think is very interesting, very concrete, very simple, and as we'll see later, not just phenomenologically, but also theoretically motivated. Well, I'm going fast. You guys got to slow me down. Okay. Um, but, okay, so this is a, a, a two Higgs doublet model, okay? It's a very specific two Higgs doublet model with a specific structure. I have one Higgs doublet that has an ordinary quadratic plus quartic term and has a negative uh, uh, quadratic term. Then I have another Higgs sector which has just a quadratic term plus this linear term, okay? So I'm just writing down the most important couplings, okay? And this mass squared is positive, okay? So, you can see what happens very, very simply in the limit where kappa goes to zero, this linear term goes to zero, I just have two decoupled Higgs doublets, one of which gets a VEV sigma and the other one doesn't, okay? 
Now I'm going to turn on kappa and treat it as a perturbation. In the low energy theory, if uh, m sigma squared is much bigger than m h squared, in the low energy theory, the leading effect of this is going to be just the fact that sigma gets a vev gives a tadpole for the little h. Okay? So the, the, the potential for this little h here is rather than being quadratic plus quartic, it's linear plus uh, quadratic. And so it looks just like this. It looks like a shifted uh, harmonic oscillator. Okay? And the Higgs vev is just given by some expression like this. Okay? Now, I want to identify the H field with the, uh, the, the excitations of the H field with the 125 GeV Higgs that's been observed in, uh, at the LHC. So that means that uh, I, need, I, I need not only to get the mass right, I also need to get the couplings of the Higgs right. They've been uh, measured to about 10% to agree with the standard model. And the way to guarantee that is that the light field, or the, the field, the, the H field, has to have uh, the dominant share of the VEV. Okay? So what I need is I need the VEV F of the sigma field to be small compared to the total VEV V. I need this mass squared of this heavy field to be larger than MH squared. And that requires the quartic coupling of this uh, sigma to be large. When I say much larger than one here, in practice, I'm going to be taking numbers of order one. I'm just talking about the parametrics right now. Okay? And you can ask whether that's really consistent with treating kappa as a perturbation. After all, when kappa goes to zero, then the VEV of the H field is zero. On the other hand, I'm requiring it to be the dominant source of electroweak symmetry breaking. So actually, you can check that these conditions are compatible with each other. So if I'm doing the expansion in kappa, you can work out that the expansion parameter is actually a, an expansion in this combination of parameters right here. Okay? So in order for this tadpole approximation to be valid, I need this combination of parameters epsilon to be small. On the other hand, I need V to be bigger than F, say a few times bigger than F, in order to get the, elect the, the, the constraints right. And you can actually see that this is, this is perfectly OK. But it does require, at least parametrically, it requires a large uh, quartic for this sigma. OK? So you may be a bit suspicious about having some low energy theory with a linear term. Of course, the reason I don't just write that down in the standard model is it's not gauge invariant. But remember, here I'm integrating out uh, electroweak breaking fields, so that's the first order answer. Um, in a little more detail, you could say you, you, the, the co more correct, and the correct way of looking at this is to say that uh, we have a nonlinear realization of electroweak symmetry from this sigma. And so there are some Goldstone fields here that are the, the, the angular modes in sigma that survive below the sigma mass, right? If sigma was all there was, those would be the longitudinal Ws and Zs. Those things, uh, these pseudoscalars pi coming from sigma will mix with the pseudoscalars coming from H. So actually this tadpole is dressed up by these Goldstones and the pseudoscalars mix. Okay, and so that's actually uh, an important part of the phenomenology. So let's take a look at those. So I have, I include the excitations of H, um, uh, the pseudoscalar excitations of H. Those mix with the pseudoscalar excitations from sigma, okay, which I call pi here. And what you can see is that the physical pseudoscalar is an admixture of these guys, which is mostly the sigma. Okay, mostly because I'm assuming F is smaller than V. VH is the VEV of H, right? So these are mostly sigma, and the Eden Goldstones are mostly H, which they have to be because H has most of the VEV. Okay? And so what does the spectrum of this kind of theory look like? So there's the usual uh, standard model spectrum down here. And then I have these pseudoscalars here, which are mostly made out of the... Uh, the, 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 these uh, sigma guys, okay? And they have a mass uh, given parametrically like this. And then I have the sigma fields, and you can see there's a hierarchy of order epsilon between these guys right here, okay? And above, it's only above the sigma scale that I see the full electroweak symmetry uh, being restored, okay? So again, just the, 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 the parametrics here um, the coupling of the Higgs to vectors is given by something like this. 
coupling of Higgs to fermions like this. So notice that when f is small, these approach the standard model values. Okay? And if I want something like a 10% accuracy, I need something like uh, f to be about a third of v or something like that. Right? Okay? Um, one of the things that is, is very interesting phenomenologically and also shows you that this is nothing like the standard model with uh, additional operators is that the uh, notice in all of this, I never put in a quartic term for the Higgs. Of course, it wouldn't hurt to put such a thing in, but if I don't have one, if I don't put one in, then the quartic and also the cubic coupling is, is suppressed by this parameter epsilon, actually epsilon squared compared to the standard model value. Okay. And just remind you that phenomenologically, suppressing the cubic H coupling actually enhances the HH production because it's usually, it eliminates a destructive interference that's usually there. So in this kind of a model, these additional Higgs bosons definitely do not decouple. They're in a very important part of electroweak symmetry breaking. In fact, electroweak symmetry breaking wouldn't break without them. That's why we call it induced electroweak symmetry breaking. And this also means that if you work out the coupling of these heavy states to things like the light Higgs, WZs, tops, and so on, they are unsuppressed, uh, as opposed to the normal decoupling limit where they are, where they are suppressed, typically, especially at least the couplings to the Ws and Zs. Okay. So, so far I've just talked about this as a possible way of uh, having non-decoupling physics in the Higgs sector. Um, but uh, there's also a theoretical motivation for this, uh, for this kind of model in the context of supersymmetry. So in supersymmetry, the problem that I have is that, uh, and at least in the MSSM, that the, the quartic couplings for the Higgs are given by the gauge coupling squared. And therefore, the mass of the Higgs is of order the quartic times the Veb squared, which is of order mz squared. And it's not just a parametric thing like this. There's a tree-level bound that says that the lightest Higgs has to be lighter than mz, as we know. So there are various ways of getting around this. One, in the MSSM itself, we can just look at loop corrections. The problem with that is that we need m stop to be large to make this logarithm large. This is the correction to the quartic. But if we make that large, then there, this should be quad, m, m stop squared. I apologize. There's a quadratically sensitive cont contribution to the Higgs mass squared. So this leads to a tuning of, uh, uh, of, of, of at, least one, at least the 1% level, even in the low energy MSSM. Okay. So if we don't like that, we can, the, the typical thing that's been tried is to look at new contributions to the quartic. So we can have new tree-level contributions from D terms, from F terms. We can have some uh, partial Higgs compositeness, fat Higgs models, and so on. These are all have in common that they're trying to increase the quartic from this G squared. Okay. But based on what I've just said, there's another possibility, which is induced electroweak symmetry breaking. Who needs a quartic? So in the MSSM, a quartic is naturally small. That's exactly a natural situation where we could try to do what uh, I've just done here. Okay. Now, um, do I say this here? I don't know where I, just a second. Let me just look a look here. I think I should say it here. Yeah. Okay. So let me just say it here. I didn't think I put it on a slide, but you might think that here I'm just postponing the problem one step, right? Because if you were paying attention before, I said that we needed uh, a large quartic, but now the, the quartic was for this other field, okay? So we do need a large quartic somewhere uh, else. But the point here is that uh, this other Higgs field doesn't have to have any Yukawa couplings, okay? So this, the field with the large quartic doesn't have to have any Yukawa couplings, and so it turns out it's, lar it's easier to give it a large quartic. Okay? And I'll give some examples of that. Okay? So the general framework here is that we have the MSSM with its field H up and H down, and H up and H down have the normal Yukawa couplings. Okay? Then in addition, I have some what we call the auxiliary Higgs sector. It includes some Higgs doublets sigma, and also some new fields phi, okay, whose role we'll talk about in a second. And there can be couplings like this, phi sigma h. Okay? And this auxiliary Higgs sector has to be more strongly coupled than the MSSM Higgs sector. It needs to have bigger quartics in particular. right? 
And there are two ways that it can do that, at least two ways, or two limiting ways it can do that. One is for it to truly be a strongly coupled theory, truly like Technicolor, okay? And the other possibility is to write down perturbative models, and I'll talk about both of those. So, uh, the first class of models were actually written down by us first, okay? Uh, Superconformal Technicolor, okay? And here the idea is that this auxiliary Higgs sector is really some strongly coupled superconformal sector. And what happens to it, and as what, what that means is that it is at a strong fixed point. It is basically strong at all scales, okay? So above the TeV scale, far above the TeV scale, it is supersymmetric and conformal and strongly coupled at all scales. And we definitely have concrete examples of theories like this, and we, we actually analyze concrete examples in this theory. Then we assume that supersymmetry is broken at the TeV scale. So back here, we, supersymmetry breaking feeds into both of these sectors here uh, at the TeV scale. And at the TeV scale, uh, SUSY breaking triggers confinement and electroweak symmetry breaking. This is very plausible. For example, the scalars will get a mass from electroweak symmetry breaking, but the fermions will typically be protected. So you'll end up with some gauge theory with no scalars and fermions that very typically uh, confines and breaks electroweak symmetry breaking, and breaks electroweak symmetry. So we can imagine there's being some uh, F scale associated with this technicolor of, eight, of order 80 GeV. That turns out to be a good number for all the phenomenological constraints. And then the, the resonance masses of this sector are then around one TeV, right? Because the coupling is so large, it's now non-perturbatively large, the mass of the resonance is very high. And the kinds of couplings that we imagine adding are linear in the elementary Higgs fields, and they are then proportional to some operators in the strongly coupled sector, sort of like psi bar psi, right? Where the sort of technicolor is contracted through here. And this VEV induces the tadpole, just as, as we talked about, okay? Now, you may be thinking that uh, I've, I've, I've gone off the wagon because we all know that Technicolor died not once, but at least four times, right? First of all, soon after it was invented, it was realized it had terrible flavor problems. Then in the 1990s, precision electroweak predictions, uh, corrections were, were too large. The top cork was discovered in 1995, something that was much too large to accommodate in Technicolor. And finally, in 2012, the light Higgs was directly discovered, and there was this famous slide by, by, by Nima that many of people have reproduced, but a lot of people haven't really looked carefully at this slide. If you look carefully, you actually see that there may be a chance, okay, that's something. All right, but let me explain to you that actually it's not just that I have four different uh, excuses for all these things. Really, these, these things are just, they're just completely, this is a completely different sort of beast here, okay? Because first of all, what's really crucial is that flavor, the Yukawa couplings are just done by the ordinary light Higgs. Okay, I have, I have the elementary Higgses, I have the ordinary Yukawa couplings, there are no problems with flavor whatsoever. Okay, so forget about those. Um, precision electroweak, there, there, there's still a worry, there's still some problem. But the fact is that, uh, so first of all, you might think for a millisecond that having F much smaller than V will suppress the electroweak corrections by some power of F over V. Alas, that is not the case. Um, uh, and it's basically because the S and the T parameters are really dimensionless things, okay? So they're not suppressed by that. But the, the crucial thing is really the S parameter, and it is suppressed because of the fact that in, in ordinary technicolor, about half of the contribution from S comes from the heavy vector resonances, and the other half comes from the light uh, technipions. And that comes from the fact that the light technipions are dominantly the longitudinal W and Z. Here, they are dominantly not the longitudinal W and Z. So the S parameter is about half of what it is in, in technicolor. And if you look at a minimal theory of technicolor, not these crazy things with, you know, with, with whole techni generations that were needed for flavor, again, flavor, uh, they were already sort of marginal with precision electroweak, so this is actually fine. Plus, you can get a positive contribution from the T parameter from the fact that you had different couplings H up and H down. So this can very easily bring you back into the, the precision electroweak ellipse. Z to BB bar is actually somewhat constraining, but actually works. The light Higgs couplings work fine, okay? So I claim that there's, there's really no problem with these theories. 
And we'll look at some of the details of the phenomenology in just a little bit. However, no matter what I say, most of you won't like non-perturbative physics, okay? Um, so another possibility is to have perturbative models, okay? So here the idea is that these auxiliary Higgs fields are charged under a new gauge group, okay? And the very simplest minimal thing is just some SU2, okay? And because they're charged under a new SU2, they have additional D terms in their quartic. So if this SU2 is somewhat strongly coupled at the weak scale, I mean, you know, stronger than U1 hypercharge, basically, or SU2 weak, then they will have additional quartics, and that can make this whole mechanism work, okay? So this is conceptually similar to the uh, non-decoupling D terms that have been discussed earlier. And so the basic idea is that we have an SU2 S, this extra gauge symmetry. It's broken by the VEV of some phi particles at the scale U. Below that scale, we have the electroweak gauge group, and then we have these uh, psi particles getting a VEV, and uh, these are the, uh, the induced electroweak symmetry breaking fields. Okay? Um, I'm going to uh, sort of skip over this slide unless there, somebody wants to ask sort of model building questions. There are some nice features of the model building. Actually, unification and precision electroweak work out quite well. And here, you can't, uh, you know, we can really just, of course, calculate precision electroweak, and we did, and everything is, is, is fine. Bottom line, you can ask, how well do you do? Uh, this is sort of motivated by uh, eliminating the tuning in the MSSM, and so how well do you do? And here is the, the most important parameters in the theory are the gauge coupling of this GS and the VEV F, okay? And in this plane, what you see is that there's a line here, and in this line right here, um, I didn't talk about this limit, but in this limit, you actually go back to the standard model. So actually, one of the reasons that you sort of know the phenomenology of this model is going to work is it has a limit where it does have a decoupling limit, okay? So in that limit, you're guaranteed to get back the standard model. Of course, in that limit, the Higgses are also very heavy, and you have not solved this, this tuning problem, okay? But then, if you, on the other hand, if you go away from this limit, you eventually get into problems with Higgs couplings. That's the gray region. And so what you're left with is this uh, white region, which first of all is a pretty big size region. And second of all, you can see the tuning contours. You see you're never really tuned in any of the allowed parameter space, right? So I don't know about you, but I never liked these things where people said we scanned 10 million points and we found one that wasn't fine-tuned. That looks a little suspicious. Here it's just not tuned, period. End of story. Okay, so <clears throat> let's look at the phenomenology of this. Okay, so in general, in the phenomenology of this, you have many, you can have any number of additional Higgs bosons. So we wanted to, since we were motivated by supersymmetry, we wanted to look at the minimal thing we could in the context of supersymmetry. That would be a three Higgs doublet model. So in addition to the H up and H down, we have this new field sigma. Okay. And then, uh, but then what we assume is that one linear combination of HU and HD does approximately decouple. So we really are left in the end with a two Higgs doublet model. Uh, but it's now a type one two Higgs doublet model because only this linear, the light linear combination of H up and H down has Yukawa couplings, okay? And you can certainly look at more complicated things, but we think this is, uh, this is a good representation of the, the phenomenology. So, uh, uh, so what does the effective theory look like? It has uh, pretty much the potential that we, we talked about. Uh, we actually do include a quartic potential for the Higgs, but the point is that since we don't assume any heavy stops or any other mechanism to beef it up, it's not very important phenomenologically. It's actually only important for the cubic coupling, which directly gets a contribution from this. Okay? So with this simplified model, we have five parameters here. Uh, we can fix uh, the VEVs and the mass, or, sorry, we can affix the VEV, the mass of, of course, the total VEV V and the mass of the light Higgs, okay? And uh, so we're left with three parameters, and we usually look in this plane of F and lambda sigma for some particular value of tan beta. So we looked at all of the current constraints, 
okay, on this, uh, on this model. And here they are plotted in the plane of uh, sigma and MA. We actually don't use uh, F because this shows the different constraints in a, in, a, in, a, in a better way. And what you can see here is that, uh, for example, the, the Higgs coupling constraints are here, or this vertical line here. I'm sorry, that's a little bit hard to see. Um, but, sorry, yeah. Uh, I believe that's right, yeah, this line right here. But they're actually, the direct searches are actually more constraining. Uh, A to ZH in particular is extremely constraining here in this model. But we considered many other, many other things. And one way of saying how, uh, 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 how non thank you how non standard this is is that we can ask given the experimental constraints what is the smallest value of the Higgs cubic coupling that's still allowed okay and what you can see here is that here's the, the, the contours are shown here here's 0.4 here's 0.7 so we can have around half of the standard model value uh, in this simplified model okay and uh, if you look at what the uh, I guess it should be the 13 TV LHC, but it doesn't make too much difference. If we look at the 14 TV projections, what we see is that uh, A to Z H uh, and, uh, is this, this purple hatched region and A to T T bar are expected to be the, the strongest constraints. Okay? All right? And here, you can see you're now pushing things out so that you need about, you can only have about point, if you don't see anything in the, uh, in, 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 at the 14 TV LHC with 400 inverse femtobarns, you can only have about 0.8 times the standard model value for the cubic coupling. Okay, because so we would like to know whether the cubic coupling could perhaps be a discovery mode for new physics, but uh, that will only be done with the high luminosity LHC, right? Okay. Now, one comment I wanted to make here is if you look at this plot, one thing that if you're uh, following this in detail, which probably nobody is, is that, uh, in fact, you can't really see it very well. I apologize. But if you look at the, 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 the Higgs couplings, the, the, the Higgs coupling constraints have not really improved much compared to the previous plot. Okay? So I just want to explain what's going on there. Um, and this just, again, emphasizes, the, I think, the important complementarity between direct and, and, and indirect searches. See, the thing is, is that if you look at the present, the, the, present, uh, 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 the, the, the present preferred value of the atlas and CMS bits is already in somewhat in tension with the standard model and in a direction which is bad for our model, right? Our model wants to move things in this way, uh, whereas the standard model lives here. Okay, so they're too strong already, too strong if you're a believer in the standard model. So that was incorporated in the initial slide, and we did the only thing we could think of that was sensible for the other slide. We assumed that at the next run, you'll converge on the standard model value. If that's true, you'll get significantly reduced error bars, but because, you know, you've removed the tension, then, okay? So that explains why you know, our, the Higgs constraints didn't get stronger. But it, doesn't, it means, doesn't mean these are not important. I mean, to the contrary, obviously, if they were to converge on this value or, you know, something compatible with the present value, it would be extremely constraining and, of course, extremely interesting for everybody, okay? So, but the direct detection bounds are, are, are the direct searches are also incredibly important. Um, in the strongly coupled models, we considered both the, uh, there is the sort of model independent part, which is the, the A, the, these extra pseudoscalars, which are parametrically light compared to the strong interaction scale. And there, uh, there the, here I'm showing the, uh, the present bounds here on those from LHC 8, okay? And then this is basically the boundary where your effective field theory breaks down. So you see that as far as the, and here's A to tau tau. So you can see that uh, as far as the present bounds go, it's already very constrained. On the other hand, you can have values over here which have very, very small values of lambda h over lambda standard model. There's essentially no limit to how small it can be. But if you look at LHC 14 with only 20 inverse femtobarns, it's going to completely clobber everything here. Okay? So this basically, if you don't like Technicolor, you won't have to wait long or you'll have to, you'll, have, you'll know, we'll know soon. 
okay, whether this, uh, this kind of model has any chance of being right. And we, I'm not going to show it, but we have constraints. There are interesting constraints on the vector resonances, but the there's more model dependence, and the story is much less clear than here. Lots and lots of constraints. Okay, so that's it. Um, I hope I've uh, uh, convinced you or made you think that perhaps uh, induced electroweak symmetry baking is an uh, interesting possibility. It's, it's motivated theoretically by uh, generating the 125 GeV Higgs in supersymmetry without fine tuning. Also, I think just phenomenologically, it's interesting as an example of non-decoupling physics. Um, it's consistent with all bounds. It'll be uh, stringently tested, and in fact, direct searches for new Higgs states really dominate uh, the phenomenology here. Okay, thank you. Okay, so time for a few questions. So, so as someone who does like strong dynamics, you're talking about some heavy sector that's giving you a small value of f? Well, it's, it's not that small, and it's not that heavy. So it's just technicolor scaled down by, say, a factor of 3. And, and do I have states at the, at the scale 4 pi f? Yeah. So I do have those states. Yeah. So, it's, so just it's the standards. Normal, it's just normal technicolor scaled down by a factor of 3. So that's, you know, what that does two things. Uh, it makes the states lighter. So you might think that I should be dead because I have strongly coupled states. But it also makes them couple less to electroweak because they have, there's a smaller share of the VEV. So for example, the dominant way to produce uh, you know, techni rows or vector resonances in the strong sector is just by mixing with the W and Z. But that mixing is, 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 is now suppressed, actually. So, so yeah, so anyway, you, we, we really did the phenomenology. And so it is not, uh, you know, there's a lot of, we, we, don't, we don't know all the parameters of the, of the technicolor row, but you can see that there are, you know, strong constraints, but not, not ruled out. Uh, yeah, it's just technicolor scaled down by a factor of three. That's all it is. Four, maybe. Other questions? Uh, your strongly coupled version reminds me of something, warp space, I did, you may know, with the, what's the, is it the 4D version or something you? Uh, uh, the actual the actual model we wrote down was a was a was a, 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 a version of SUSY QCD. The strong sector is some some SUSY QCD model in the middle of the conformal window. Okay. So, but yes, you could definitely make a 5D version of this. You would just have a supersymmetric uh, bulk, and uh, I don't see any problem with doing that. Yeah, uh, something I was thinking, uh, I was doing with the Jaco and so on in 2004. Yeah, so you, and, uh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, you could, I'm sure you could make a model like that. We didn't, we didn't actually do it, but I, I think you can, you can definitely do it. And because in the basis of mass ion states, then it's like quartic is coming from your big quartic coupling times mixed.